officially, it's great to see you, man. Thank yeah, you for being here. Yeah, yeah. And we almost saw each other in Cancun a couple of months ago. At, True. Yeah. And uh, we yeah. missed each other. I know that was crazy. You guys are kind of in and out of there. Yeah. But yeah. I got to tell you, man, while I've got you here, uh, and I think I texted this to you, the other, your other guitarist in the band, Billy Morrison, mm -hmm. came and sat in with me for a bit. Oh, great. But um, I yeah. had not seen you play. Well, I had not seen Billy Idol play in a long time. Yeah. And I know you were kind enough to invite me a couple times when you did the residency here in Vegas. Absolutely. And yeah. I wasn't in town. Right. So I was really excited to see Billy. And at that particular event, and I said this with all respect to all the other acts that played over the weekend, right. you guys were the slam dunk and the biggest crowd because, you know, what, what you and Billy do, it checks the pop fans love it, the hard rock fans love it. It's the most mass appeal. Right. It fits in that so well. True. I was blown away by how good the band was. I know how great you are, of course. I was floored at how good Billy still is, because yeah, I hadn't yeah. seen him in a long time. Yeah, he's the real deal. The yeah, guy had, like, what, yeah. you know, taken off his shirt, and yeah. he's cut, and he, he looks yeah. and sounds, he's, like, yeah. he aged in reverse. <laughs> it's nuts. And I'll even, be sure to tell him that. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know him at all, but yeah. I'd love to talk to him one day. And, yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. I, was, I was blown away, but the, the, the whole band, the whole vibe, and then, of course, you had the, the, the great solo moment in mm -hmm. there as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I just, you know, I had to tell you that, because I just, I came on the air the next day raving about it, and I'm just like, my God, the songs, and... How has it been in, in these recent years since you've been back playing with him? Mm -hmm. You've done a couple of uh, Vegas residencies. I know there's yeah. a new EP, but as far as just the whole uh, plan with him going forward, where are things at now? Yeah, we, um, you know, we managed to do the EP even during uh, uh, when COVID hit. We, uh, we did four songs with Butch Walker, um, <clears throat> and we've continued to work, you know, um, the, we have another EP coming out, and uh, it's it's kind of the other side of the coin. First EP was a bit more retrospective, uh, a bit mellow. I can guarantee you this next one is not mellow. And, uh, you know, we're just at a, at a point where um, we really, most, most, most importantly, Eddie, we really value the relationship. And you got these two guys that we're coming up on 40 years working together. It's 30, 39 years. And, um, and we really value that. And I think when fans see that, I always say that's the best special effect that we have is that chemistry. Um, it's and, amazing. It really is. And, um, and we, uh, you know, we, we, um, we genuinely uh, admire each other. And, re and, and, uh, and, and we love the results of what happens when the two of us get in a room and write and then get on stage. It's undeniable. And, uh, and I'm just really... Uh, Really glad to, you know, uh, still be doing it with him, man, you know. You can tell, you can feel that mutual respect. He gives you a lot of... He does. A yeah. lot up there, and, and of course, you know, he... He, he he's Billy Idol. He's doing his thing. Yeah, you know, I'm curious. You mentioned like 40 years that that you guys have been working together. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I know. Where did the Where did the first meeting happen? Um, at the uh, coin offices. You know, um, the last, the tail end of uh, Generation X. Bill the Coin was the manager, the, the manager of Kiss. If people don't know. Yeah. And. Um, my my band previous to Billy Idol was managed by a coin, and it kind of... What it, band was that? There's a band called Fine Malibus. I know, it's a terrible name. <laughs> Did it come out? It didn't. We recorded a, an album with Jimmy Miller, the producer of the Rolling Stones, down in the Bahamas, um, and the whole, the whole project fell apart after that but never released never released yeah. you have the music still um i mean i have like a, a transfer of a cassette and you know i have no idea where the but it was a finished you know, record it was a finished record yeah, did you have a yeah, deal yeah we were signed to island and they shelved it yeah it was just not meant to be and what um, was the material like i'm um, always interested in these <laughs> lost records um there's I, I think on my youtube channel you can go i've uploaded it uh, the record in in like third generation copy, but uh, there's actually some like people. Uh, there's little elements of things that eventually ended up on Billy Idol records. Oh, okay. The, the intro of Rebel Yell that was part of. Something. Really? Oh yeah, I'd been sitting on that for years. See, I love this of, kind of stuff because yeah. it's so, the lost records are so interesting to me. You know, and um, and the uh, <clears throat> so anyway, so we were uh, we started to become managed by Billy Coin and and. Um, and I said, you know, I think this has gone about as far as it can be. And I left the band and a coin continued to manage me. And we had placed an ad 
in the Village Voice. I was looking to form another band, and it was like, I don't remember exactly, but guitarist looking for everything, you know, singer, bass player. And we ran it for one week or whatever, and then Bill called me and said, do you know who Billy Idol is? And by then, uh, he had released um, Dance With Myself as a as a extended dance remix. He had left Generation X uh, and had moved to New York. And uh, Bill said, you, you guys should meet up and see if there's something there. And um, and it was really innocent, you know. It was There was no master plan or anything. It was just like, you know, uh, I knew every musician in New York. I had lived, been living in, in Manhattan. And I said, look, if you're looking to put a band together, I know all of, you know, I'll suggest people. And then when it's time for a guitarist, I hope, hopefully you'll consider me. And, uh, and the rest is history. Was it instant chemistry when you started writing and working with them? Did, did you hit it off immediately? Um, no, we had to find common ground because here's a guy who came from, you know, 1977 punk rock London, part of the, what was called the Bromley Contingent, and it was, you know, Susie and the Banshees, and, you know, Billy was there at, like, the first Sex Pistol shows and all this, so, um, but I'm a, I'm a, a product of early 70s rock guitar, all my guys are Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck and all this kind of stuff, and it was like, well, how do we make that work with this, and... Funnily enough, it was the fact that uh, a lot of the New York bands, being from New York, I think was was a real help because I I, I loved the Ramones and I loved uh, you know Lou Reed and all the New York stuff and uh, and that that was the common ground. He said, "Oh, you like that stuff?" I go, "Yeah," and I love Bowie and Mick Ronson and all that sweet and all. Oh, you like that? Yeah, I grew up on that. And that was where we kind of found common ground. But I, and I think that that stew, if you will, is what makes Billy's music with that you guys do together so unique and so interesting, and Absolutely. so and having such a wide appeal right. that it appeals to punk people, pop people, new wave people, hard rock people like myself. Right. There's something in there for everybody, but it's still a unique thing. And that mix is, uh, you know, of you guys coming together like that it makes a lot of sense. That that's how it it played out. Yeah, I mean. Um I th you know, in my mind, the last thing that he needed was, uh, you know, you'd done, done, you know, three records with Generation X. He didn't need a, 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 a guy who was trying to emulate that. Um, and I, I thought, I always say that it's better to have musicians that are more than capable and maybe you can edit down rather than always having to push somebody to play, some, you know, like, oh, can you do, you know, uh, you know, to the, it's better to have more, <laughs> you know, more capabilities than than somebody that you really are like always pushing to, you know, mm. present something. Do you remember the first thing you guys wrote together? Um, might have been Shooting Stars uh, or Hole in the Wall. A lot of, you know, our first, it's funny, we rehearsed, we finally got the band together. We got Phil, Phil Fight uh, and Steve Missel, uh, the drummer. Phil was in a band called Revolver. He was be briefly in Riot, but I, the guitarist, the gu I grew up in Rockaway and there was a guitarist named John Morales who was the local guitar hero. And he was in this band Revolver. I went to see them in New York. And, um, and I saw Phil and I made note of that. And when I met Billy, I said, you know, I saw this bass player, it's really cool and he fit skinny, you know, look, looks the part, you know. Um, so we started rehearsing right away um, in the music building on 8th Avenue. And funnily enough, Madonna was like two floors up. And, oh, wow. Yeah, it was all these bands just getting getting their, their stuff together at that point. And uh, it was a good little, good little, uh, you know, good little environment for us because it was a lot of people really... Um, you know, exchanging ideas and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, you're si you you live here in Vegas now, and uh, for years you lived in L.A. But I still hear the New York in you, bro. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just hearing you talk hey, now. I'm hey, like, yeah, New York. Hey, you know? hey, <laughs> hey dude. <laughs> do you miss it? Do you, do you get back often? Do you miss it? You know, I don't have family there. My mom lives in in Florida. Um, 
<clears throat> you know, I grew up on the street in Rockaway where my aunts and uncles lived there, and my cousins, and, and uh, you know, they seemed like they reached a certain age, and the bus showed up, and they all <laughs> shipped them off to Florida. <laughs> As is the case. So, but I've, I've visited my where I grew up, and it's, you know, it's... Uh, seems so small now, you know, compared to when I was a kid. Um, I love going back to New York. You know, it's not the same city that it was when I made my career. There was, I mean, at that point, the late 70s, uh, early 80s was just a great period of time because, A, you had all the labels there. There was venues, bands were getting signed. All my guitar buddies were all getting gigs. Uh, you know, my friend uh, Eddie Martinez eventually went on with Robert Palmer. Um, and so it was, anything was possible. And, um, and there was a lot of, you know, a lot of recording studios happening. So um, I missed that aspect of it, but I, I, lo I love going back to it. Yeah. But from a music standpoint, and I've lived in New Jersey, just outside of New York my whole life, mm -hmm. from a music standpoint, there's nothing there anymore. If you think about it, I no. mean, of course, bands come through there and, and shows happen, right? But no, I don't know anybody that lives there anymore. When we were doing that metal mm -hmm. show, mm -hmm. which you were on at one point, I think, if mm -hmm. I'm mistaken, but mm -hmm. you played on it, I think, didn't you? you played I did, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 When we were doing that, we mm -hmm. initially started doing that the first couple of years, the first couple of seasons, we did it in New York, mm -hmm. and we realized like nobody, nobody's here. We can't get anybody to to come in, right. everyone was looking for flights from LA or, or Nashville or wherever they were. Gotcha. So then the next 10 seasons we did, we did it in LA cause that's where everybody was. Uh -huh. Now what's interesting is sure. You still have a big contingency in LA, mm -hmm. but now it, uh, there's nothing in New York. Unfortunately, no, hardly anyone lives there anymore in the music community mm -hmm. in terms of performers. Mm -hmm. And then it seems like now it's either here in Vegas mm -hmm. or Nashville. Right. right. I mean, that's where, right. and, and right. of course still LA to some degree, but yeah. those are the three spots. It yeah. seems like, well, when, when I, I came out initially to, to uh, there was a period of time that Billy and I didn't work together uh, around the Charm Life record, and then we reconvened, and I went out. I was still living in New York, and I went out to L.A. Uh, to work with him, and everyone had home studios, and everyone had space. You couldn't have a home studio in New York, and I went, oh, well, this is cool. You know, I remember one of the first people I met was Duff McKagan, and he had a home studio, and and uh, and I started to see all my New York buddies moving out there, and um, and I just uh, you know I went from living in a hotel to a residential hotel, and then getting an apartment, and um, and you know I never planned on moving out of New York, but it just inevitably happened. And also, <clears throat> there used to be a thing in New York called ARR resident uh, residencies, which were artists in residence, and this is what enabled all those bands in the late seventies and early eighties to afford rent because buildings would get zoned for artists. And, um, and once they took that away and the, the you know, rent skyrocketed, music, musicians couldn't afford to live in, and rehearse in New York anymore. Yeah. I'm curious, growing up in New York and the, the influences you, you said that, that you, you had, what was your first ever concert? What did you see? Who, what what act did you see first? Okay, um, <clears throat> well, my brother took me to see the James Gang in Central Park, but I was so young. I, I was I was a little kid by that point. My my first. Oh That's my, all right. Don't worry about it. You do it later. Um, <clears throat> the first concert that I bought tickets for on my own and went to go see was Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, Brain Salad Surgery at Madison Square Garden in Quadraphonic, <laughs> and I was a big fan of you know all those uh kind of early progressive rock guitar players they really appealed to me yes and genesis and all that stuff because um i was uh, you know i i had uh my first the, the first guitar teacher that i really kind of like admired was a flamenco guitarist so i had a you know in my back pocket i had a bit of flamenco and some jazz stuff and all this and when i heard the the um progressive rock guitar players they were utilizing those influences in the music and so yeah emerson like palmer wow yeah. that's heavy and uh, just noticing that uh speaking of touring uh, there is a bunch of dates coming up where you and billy idol uh, billy idol going out opening for journey uh, that tour starts in pittsburgh on february 22nd and a, a good run of shows 
That should be fun. That should be a good one, huh? Yeah, it'd be a great night for guitar players. And <clears throat> and then when we finish, Toto goes out. So it's then Steve Lukather and, and uh, Neil Schoen. I'll go to the, well, I'll go see one of those shows. <laughs> go see Luke. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So you got a good run of dates uh, there. Um, mm -hmm. Do you do you think you'll have the next EP out by then or not? Or that too soon? Um, well, that starts March. Probably not. But we, you know what? We never think about that. We will definitely be playing some material from that. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So did you ever see Zeppelin live? Because you mentioned you're a big Jimmy Page guy. I didn't. You didn't? How yeah, did that yeah. happen? Um, or not happen? Yeah, I don't... You know, I had... <laughs> it's crazy. I had tickets to go see Deep Purple, and um, and that was at Nassau Coliseum. And then an article came out about, uh, like a week before, about how Deep Purple was the loudest band uh, in history, and it was destroying kids... Uh, brain cells or something. My parents wouldn't let me go to see Deep Purple. And then I said, well, I'll go see Led Zeppelin. And um, tickets were sold out. And tickets were very expensive. I mean, for a kid, you know, I had a paper route. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. so uh, I never got to see Zeppelin. I saw um, about uh, two months after I saw ELP, I went to see Yes. And I was a big Steve Howe fan. And, mm -hmm. and I saw them in... Uh, and, um, uh, also incredible. I mean, th these were the bands that were like spearheading great concert sound and lights and, you know, it was all kind of new then. Yeah. So as a kid to, to experience that in 20, you know, Madison Square Garden was just like 20,000 punters, you know, in there to, to, to see these, you know, it was so different then. I'm sure you know, because sure. you didn't know everything about their lives. Of course. Or so these bands, especially the ones from England or, or Europe, would come, and they were like aliens. It was the only time you could see them. They were like mythological creatures up there. And uh, My it, first my first concert was Kiss at the Garden in 77. Well, talk about... Talk about rock, aliens. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Talk about not knowing. Yeah. When I'm 13, 12 years old. I'm like, what is going on? I mean, it was right? life-changing. And back then, they really kept their... their Anonymity? Their, yeah. yeah. I mean, you couldn't, I mean, there may be like one photo of, you know, Paul with a, you know, scarf over his right. face because he couldn't, you couldn't show his face. I tell younger yeah. people all the time about that, that are in the kiss. I'm like, you don't understand mm. how it was growing up when right. I, it's, it was a whole different thing. It was just like, oh, is this guy really spitting real blood? Mm -hmm. Is this like, it was like. You, there was no internet. You didn't know anything ago. You didn't exactly. know how they talked. You didn't know who they were. You didn't know that yeah. Gene was a businessman. Right. You know, any of that stuff, yeah, you know? Exactly. Exactly. What was um for you getting your first guitar and 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 you mentioned that uh, obviously flamenco is a big part of what you do, and it's amazing what you do with that. But obviously there's a hard rock side to what you do also. So talk about how that came about, because you'd mentioned one of your first guitar players' uh, influences was a flamenco player. Right. So where, And then you mentioned your love of Jimmy Page. Right. So where does it all come together for you as a, as a young kid saying, I want to play guitar and I'm going to create this hybrid of things that I'm going to be able to do? Yeah, I mean... <clears throat> You know, the main thing as a kid, you know, back then, before the internet and all this, was trying to find a guitar teacher who I could identify with. Um, and I had a number of them that I didn't, you know, they was like, you know, oh, fuddy-duddy, you know. You know, I didn't inspire, they didn't inspire me and, you know, they certainly weren't going to, you know, teach me what I was looking to learn. Um, and then I, <clears throat> actually, my junior high school chorus teacher was a guitar player and he was a really cool guy um and he played guitar um he played uh, classical and jazz guitar and i started to bring him records that i like because he was turning me on to things like um you know george benson or whatever you know and uh, and i understood about technique and all that but then i would bring him my records that i dug and he was wow, you know, these, this, these guys are good, man. This is good guitar playing. And um, so it just like, <clears throat> I think also I recognize that, guy, I take a guy like Jimmy Page, he's utilizing folk music and, um, and Indian music, you know, and I always, I always strive to like bring other elements into rock and roll other than you know, we've had all that other stuff. We've we've had the you know the the Chuck Berry riffs and all this kind of stuff, and the Rolling Stones were brilliant at it. Um, but I think the first records that I bought or were in my house before I even played guitar were Beatles records, and it seemed cool to like bring in other influences, George with his Indian stuff, or you know, and then the kind of psychedelic stuff. And Hendrix certainly, uh, you know, was like 
pushing the envelope of what the guitar could do. I, th I think I always gravitated to guys who like were doing new and exciting things with the instrument. So it, it was clearly very important to you from day one to not be one dimensional. You wanted to be a, you wanted to throw a lot of different sides out there to playing when you got into playing professionally. Yeah, I think there's, you know, there's two schools. There's the Eric Clapton school where it's, you know, he's brilliant and he plays one guitar track basically and that's it. And then there's the other guys like Paige, uh, who orchestrate the music and think more like a producer or director and use different colors on the guitar. And I always, I like that aspect of it. To me, when, I, when, when writing a song or collaborating, I'm looking at it like, how can I, you know, elaborate? How can I make the verse different? And then the chorus explodes with a heavy guitar and then there's a clean guitar. And, um, and that's just always stuck with me, that painting with, with, with sound thing. Um, when, how'd you get your name? Because you weren't born Steve Stevens, but no, how did you no. become Steve Stevens? And how was that with Billy Idol or earlier? Earlier. Sylvain, Did you come up with it yourself? Sylvain, or Sylvain Sylvain? Gave me the name. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. He came by. I was in the band I was in previous to Idol. My 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 family name is Schneider, but it's not really because when um my dad's uh uh grandparents actually came over from uh and, and landed at Ellis Island, they gave them Schneider, which is a German name. I'm not German as Russian and Polish and uh, Ukrainian, um, and they, um, but they didn't speak English, so they just gave them Schneider's. Kind of like the Godfather it's when they a, came yeah, over and he gave yeah, Corleone. Just, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you just go and with it. <laughs> a Schneider is a tailor. If you go in German, you go to Germany and you want your pants fixed, you, you go to a Schneider. <laughs> so they gave him this name. <clears throat> so I just couldn't see. You know, I always had visions of, you know, uh, playing Madison Square Garden and people <laughs> chanting my name, and <laughs> Schneider <laughs> just didn't fit the bill. <laughs> So we're talking about this and we're discussing it and Sylvain Sylvain came over. We had a rehearsal <clears throat> space in our loft and he was booking rehearsal time for his band. And we're hanging out, probably smoking a joint or something. And we go, uh, you know, well, we're thinking about, I'm thinking about names. And he goes, do what I did. <laughs> name, you know, use your name twice. And I said, well, that's it. I got to use that. I'm christened by a New York doll. Yeah, so, yeah, for sure. You just yeah. added an extra S to the second one. It, exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. I yeah. did not know that the origins of that. I always find that interesting too. Yeah. You know, how do you, know, how do you come up with a name like that? But yep. it's, it works. All right, I want to run down some, some stuff here. Here because above and beyond Billy Idol, you've done and worked with a lot of different people and you continue to do so. So if you can give me a minute or two on, on a few of these projects and what, you know, how you feel about them and, and what went on with them. You didn't, you did do a record with Michael Monroe at one point. Did you not? We did. Yeah. A Jerusalem Slim, right? Yeah. I think and, it was only released in, in Japan. And what yeah. was that experience like? Um, bad. T I mean, Nirvana just hit. You know, and um, and it was, uh, you know, by the by that time, and, I, and I'm sure this is a common story to a lot of, you know, rock bands. I had done Atomic Playboys. Michael had done a, a solo record and we lived literally like three blocks from each other and um, and, uh, you know, thought, you know, thought, oh, you know, we'll combine combine forces and whatever. Um, but the record label really kind of, you know, didn't, by the time we had finished the record, they didn't really want anything, you know, there was no promotion mm. put into it. And we didn't really, you know, uh, I, th I think we just were, were kind of like directionless, you know, what do we do now? Oh, there's this grunge thing happening or do we, right. you know, I mean, that, that kind of was just like threw a monkey wrench in everything. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it was a tough time for a lot of rock acts mid nineties. Yeah. Really tough time. Yeah. yeah. But Michael is, uh, you know, such a dynamic performer and I've never I heard that record. I'd love yeah. to hear it. It's, it did come out. It did come out. Yeah. It's a Japanese import of it. I know Michael hates it. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, and it, we had gotten, uh, Michael Wagner to produce it based on the strength of slave to the grind, which we loved. Um, and then we got in the studio and I think, I think Michael Monroe, th those, those two guys just didn't connect on any level. And, and I think Michael was looking for me to play much simpler guitar as far as, uh, what, what I understand. And, um, and, uh, 
and I think we just we just couldn't find that common thread of, mm. of what. But but the dude is a, such a star. I mean, yeah. was, you know, and uh, and has you know I learned a lot about bands and you know he's a huge fan of like little richard and all this kind of roots roots um, uh american r&b music and uh I, I loved hanging with the guy uh he 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 is one of the real rock stars uh like a billy idol or you know um the, he's the real deal yeah his yeah. recent records with steve conti and those guys have been real good too i've liked what he's done with those recent records yeah so. yeah uh, what about working with vince neal how was that experience for you? Um, so it was like culture shock. You know, I was a New York guy, and I was signed to Warner Brothers and um, through Atomic Playboys, and Ted Templeman was my the guy who assigned me, the producer of uh, Van Halen. And um, I got a call from Ted and said, we've just signed Vince Neil. He's not in Motley Crue, and would you be interested? And uh, I said, sure, you know, I'll fly out. And it was... It was, uh, man, it was so different than, than New York. It was very L.A. It was a lot of debauchery, a lot of drugs, sex, and rock and roll. Um, Which the, Vince knows all about. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. He, yeah. But I loved making the record. I absolutely loved making the record with him and uh, Vic Fox on drums and Robbie Crane. And, um, and, um, and Ron Nevison was the producer. So... I stand by the record. I think the record still is really, really good. And, and obviously, you know, coming off the strength of Dr. Feelgood, I was like, man, you know, what, what an opportunity, uh, you know, to like kind of, you know, um, really play heavy rock guitar. You know, I remember we'd be we'd be in the studio <clears throat> pre-production or whatever, and, you know, I got like a, I'm used to Billy Idol. You know, the guitar solos are pretty economical. It's, you know, eight bars and get the hell out of there. And, uh, so guitar solo, 16 bars. Ah, make it longer. Uh, 32 <laughs> bars. Ah, make it longer. Can you play faster? Yeah, sure. Can you play heavier? You know, it was a, it was, I was like a kid in a candy store as far as like playing heavy rock guitar. Um, and I had a hell, of a hell of a lot of fun doing the record. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's, I, I see Vince a lot and mm -hmm. he's always out playing solo with his band now. Mm -hmm. And I always, I, I always wish he would actually, cause he only plays Motley Crue songs, which right. I get you go where your bread is buttered, yeah. but there's some stuff on that. Sister of pain was on that, right? That's right yeah. I mean, there's stuff like that. That got a good amount of play and video play and whatever. Yeah, and yeah. I still play it every once in a while on my other show here on, on, on Sirius. And, and you know, the other cool thing was we were already uh, slotted to, to open for Van Halen on that tour. And so Eddie and I were already friends. So it was, I, I just, you know, up recording the record and up through that Van Halen tour was absolutely a blast. And I look back on it as being just a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah. How did you get into, how did you get tied into Top Gun and end up playing that? Um, so the third Billy Idol record, Whiplash Smile, um, Harold Faltermeyer came in to do keyboards. He was friends with our producer, Keith Forsey. And uh, one day Harold says, oh, I'm working on this movie with Tom Cruise. And uh, Tom Cruise, oh, risky business. Okay. Um, and he said, uh, would you, would you want to play on the theme? And I uh, said, sure. And, and, you know, it was late at night. It was on a weekend. It was Saturday after the Billy Idol session. They put up the multi-track uh, for Top Gun. And I think the whole thing, the whole session maybe lasted an hour and a half, two hours. And... I never imagined that, you know, I'd win a Grammy for it. You know, I always tell musicians, man, you never know. Something that might be an afterthought or, uh, you know, a, a connection with somebody or something could, could end up being career-defining. And um, so that's how I ended up uh, working on that. You know, it's funny you say that because you mentioned Steve Luke there a second ago because mm. Toto's going to go out with Journey after you guys open right. for him. And I, I spoke to, to Luke about this once, and I asked him about the solo in Hold the Line, Toto, which is such an iconic solo. Oh, my God. And yeah. he laughs about it. He laughs. He goes, he goes I, that was one take. He goes, yeah. I didn't even put any thought into that. He goes, the one solo I get asked about the most yeah. is the one I just was like, all right, I'll just rip this and see what happens. Yeah. And that's the one. That's exactly it, yeah. And do yeah. you find that a lot in your career, like that sometimes like – you know, so, I mean, there, and I know you've worked with a lot of producers. There's some producers that pull, that pull, that pull, give me 15, 20 takes. Uh, right. And then there's others. It's like, you know, we're good. Live off the floor. Let's go. Yeah. I mean, wh what's your preference on that? Are you a guy that likes to do things repeatedly or you like well, spontaneity? Um, well, working with Idol, everything is spontaneity. And he'd always say, don't erase, because 
this is the days of, of working on analog tape. You only have so many tracks. And if you're going to redo something and erase the first one, you better be sure you can better it. And Billy always had a policy of no matter what, warts and all mis mistakes, keep that first take. And I'd go, I'm, you know, I'm a guitar player and I'm a knucklehead. And I'd always go, ah, I can make it better. I can make it better. I can make it better. And invariably, I mean, uh, solo on Rebel Yell is the first. I was going to ask you about that first take because that's my one of my favorite solos you ever did. First take. That was first take. Yeah. Did first you take. do another one? Or oh yeah, I tried to, you know, and and I thought they were getting better, and, and finally, you know, on the talk back, uh, uh, why don't you come back in here? <laughs> and they'd play me the first one, and then listen to it, and there's a just there's that thing of discovering and stumbling, and that that reckless energy. Man, sometimes that's the bet. That's exactly what's needed. Did you so that solo in Rebel Yell? Do you work that out ahead of time, or does do they roll tape and then you just you jump in and just like what comes out of you? How do you, do you how do you structure? No, we we didn't work it out. I didn't. It's instinctive. But what we did know was that okay, you know, this is going to be the title. By then we knew this is the title track from the record. The track was storming. You know, the backing track was so good with Tommy Price on drums. And I knew it had to be more than just a bunch of notes. And I said, we need some cool sound effect or whatever. And that's, I had brought in Tommy Bolin, uh, did a, a solo on a Billy Cobham record on Quadrant. The four. late Tommy Bolin, who was in purple for a record. That's right. Right. And I brought in that CD and I played it for our producer. And there's one part where he does this thing with the Echoplex. It's like an echo machine and it goes into regeneration. And I said, we need something as cool as that where the guitar just becomes this whole other thing. And, um, and I, I had stumbled upon using these toy ray guns, and we ended up using that. And so that was the only aspect of it that was planned out, that at some point we were going to punch me in and do this ray gun sound. You know, it's interesting. So you got a solo like that, which is wild and so, you know, great. But then if you look at your work with Billy Idol, if you look at something like Eyes Without a Face, mm. There's a guitar break in that. That's not a solo. It's yeah. a riff where right. you, dun, 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 exactly. which is a huge moment in that song. Yeah. And but that's not you going. That, so that's a whole different approach yeah. to think. Instead of going like, okay, let me see how many notes or whammy bar stuff. I'm just going to chunk out this cool riff that's going to become an iconic part of the song. Absolutely. Totally yeah. different way of thinking about it, right? Yeah. I mean, we. Um, I mean, that was uh, you know, f especially for Billy, that was such a different kind of song and. And it kind of, we were a little bit unsure about it, but the way that came out, I was living in the basement of my parents' house and the only radio station I could get was CBS FM, which was the oldie station. Oldies, yeah. And if you look at the chords and the chord structure of that song, it's, it's very similar to a lot of those like Frankie Valley and, uh, you know, um, you know, all those kind of like, uh, fifties doo-wop things. And I happened to be just messed up, messing around with those chords in rehearsal, and Billy went, oh, what's that, you know? So it morphed into one thing, and one, one thing led to another, but we always knew in the middle, it just couldn't be all ballad, you know, four minutes. It's what's so minutes. cool about it. And we said, somewhere there's got to be some electric guitar. Yeah, you know. yeah, it's, it's, so, it's so cool. I, I could talk to you about solos forever. <laughs> I want to ask you about, I couldn't let you go without asking about Michael Jackson mm. and working with him on the bad record, right? Right, yeah. Too. And 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 that experience of working with Michael, I mean, we've heard so many things about Michael, especially since he passed, mm. um, you know, very, very different things. Some, uh, what, what was your experience like with him? Um, well, I got, you know, the initially the, the connection, the, the, the connection with that was again, Ted Templeman, I have to thank, um, Ted, uh, got a call from Quincy Jones and obviously, you know, they had such success with, with beat it with Eddie and, and then now they're working out on the follow up record and they've got this track. And I guess the story that Ted told me was Quincy called and said, we've got another rock track. We, you know, we've done it with Ed, but who's the next you know, who, who, who should we get? And Ted said, uh, Steve Stevens guitars from Billy Idol and Quincy called me. Uh, we arranged, you know, the studio session and, um, and I, <clears throat> you know, I was so used to working with Idol and basically with Idol, it was, uh, he, 
myself and our producer in the studio, and I'm thinking, I gotta go do this Michael Jackson thing. It's gonna be a huge entourage. The monkey's gonna be there. There's gonna be a whole thing. It's like, you know, it's gonna be crazy. And and I'm like, man, this is gonna be different. <laughs> and I open the studio door, and it's Michael and Quincy and the engineer. That's it. And I was like, oh, this is this no is, monkey. This is yeah, no monkey. <laughs> this is how we. This is the way I work with Idol. So, um, yeah, it was just all about the music, really. It was not, it was, um, you know, Michael was um, very astute at, uh, at the the, minor, the most minute little detail. There was a thing in the, in the main guitar riff, which I didn't hear initially. It was a space where you don't play. And... Um, and Michael got on the talk back and said, you know, uh, come in. This one little space is really important. I need the space because my vocal is going to go in. Oh, okay. Um, so the attention to detail was, you know, astounding. And, um, you know, I, I, I had a blast working. With, and Quincy Jones, come on. You know, you, yeah. you don't get to work with guys like that every day. A couple other quick ones. M many people may not know this because it was fairly off the radar to some degree, unless you're a big Kiss fan. But you did a you did something with Peter Chris on a solo record, right? Yes, yeah, first record I ever recorded on, and that actually came about um, because the song that I played on First Day in the Rain I wrote, and that was a song that was part of the Fine Malibu's record, which was never released. Another one from that record, yeah. And uh, Peter heard it and said he wanted to cover it, and. Um, and I, I said, yeah, you know, we're not using, band's broken up, sure. And then he said, oh, you should come in the studio and play on it. So that's the, um, my first, that's a, that's my, that was my first uh, um, recording on a record. Wow. Yeah. And you had a band, um, and I know you still play with some of these guys here and there with um, the uh, the super group, the, the Kings of Chaos. You do that every once in a mm -hmm. while, right? Yep. But Neurotic Outsiders. Which was, I was never in that. Oh, you were never in Neurotic <laughs> Outsiders? It's, it's people keep asking me. I thought you Idol were. Was, okay, so Idol was involved in it initially, um, but I was not even living in, I hadn't even reconvened with Billy at that point. Um, so, so yeah, I was not, oh, it's Steve Jones. Steve Jones. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And the other, well, the one I know you were in because I had you guys on to promote it, but I, I'm not sure of the status or if it's still a band is Deadland Ritual. The right. band you were going to do, Geezer Butler, right. Matt Sorum, Frankie Perez. At the time I did a special with those guys at the Rainbow, you were actually here in Vegas right. playing with, with Idol, so you called right. in right. because you couldn't be there physically. Right. But, but is that band a going concern or is that pretty much done? I think it's done. Uh, although there was a lot of material that was written that um, I hope we'll see the light, and light of day in some form or another. Uh, I'm still friendly with all those guys. I think it was, you know, man, it was, it was really difficult. We went out and, <clears throat> you know, uh, we were about to sign a deal and we went out and toured Europe. And, you know, it was like, we're all seasoned <laughs> uh musicians and we're used to a certain lifestyle and here we were having to open uh you know we did a number of festival dates and small club dates and initially everyone said they were willing to do that willing to get in the trenches when reality hit um and there was crappy food and crappy hotels and and all that kind of stuff i think people lost interest i'm smiling bit, people know. can't see me smiling but yeah. i'm smiling because i called that from a mile away if i'm being honest yeah and i even said uh to geese who also i believe is here now yeah he, um, he lives here now. i i i was uh i said to geese and his wife i said uh i go you guys like because it's yeah. an interesting thing like and I tell the audience this all the time. You can have Steve Stevens. You can have a founder of Black Sabbath. You can have the guy who played drums and Guns N' Roses. All that, but all of those fans do not come to a solo project or a new project. Right. It's really almost starting from the beginning. It is absolutely starting from the beginning. And I said yeah. to Geese, I was like, are you going to go in yeah. clubs at 70-something years old? And, right. and and it's like, well, well, you know, maybe I'll pay for my own transport. Right? <laughs> right. I was like, D you yeah. know, so yeah. it's all well-intentioned, but when the rubber hits the road, exactly it's a different thing and it's like man and you of course you're used to you know what you have with idol and all that i get it but i gotta say the music that did come out from yeah. it i really liked a lot i thought it was right. really cool yeah, yeah. Really I, mean, was. I would love to see even if you don't tour and it doesn't become anything i'd love to see like a an actual record come out because i thought the the material and the pairing of the of all you guys was great i i agree and um 
And dude, I mean, you know, from the first day of rehearsal uh, to walk in there and play against the sound of, of Geezer Butler is, man, I, I would have paid. I would have paid <laughs> just to be there. Um, incredible, incredible. The sound, you know, the, for bass players to be, to have such a unique and profound influence on Ugh. music, those records and that sound that I grew up with, and there I am playing against it. It was, I mean, you know, the hair stood up on my fucking arms. I mean, it was incredible. And, and such a gentleman. And, um, and the rhythm section of him and Matt was undeniable. So, yeah, so. yeah. I would love to see that get revitalized in some way, just even if it was for on record or right, exactly. a one-off show again, because I never got a chance to see you live. But I loved what I heard. All right, so we got a real cool treat to end the show, and Steve said he hasn't even heard this yet, but his publicist sent it to me, <laughs> so we're going to premiere it and announce it for the first time. We mentioned that uh, Steve is also a master at flamenco guitar, and there is a, a tribute to Ozzy coming out of flamenco guitar where you do a flamenco instrumental version of Crazy Train. Yeah, I mean, this actually coincided with Randy. Wrote, it's, it's, it's a tribute to Randy. Okay. And when he was inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, um, I got contacted by a woman named Janet Robin, who was his, one of Randy's uh, students. And she said, would you be interested? I know you play flamenco guitar. I'm part of this, uh, what is the band called? The, the String Revolution. And they're all like uh, Spanish guitar you know, ensemble. Uh, we're doing this tribute to Randy, and we're doing tr uh, Crazy Train. <clears throat> and I, I didn't quite understand that it was going to be, you know, Spanish style. And I said, well, I don't, you know, I mean, I don't want to try and replicate something that, you know, come on, the solo on Crazy Train. You know, you know, you don't go near that. That's sacred ground. And uh, she said, no, no, we need it on nylon guitar, on Spanish guitar. I went, oh, okay, that's a cool little challenge. Um, so I ended up a uh, 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 part of this thing, and I, I believe there'll be a video for it. Um, it's an interpretation, you know, and, and, and what I think is cool about that is I know that Randy really loved playing classical guitar. Yes. And I think he would have liked this. I think he would have appreciated someone reinterpreting it for classical nylon guitar. Um, and, um, and I think it's, you know, I think it turned out pretty, pretty cool. It's a, you know, it's, it's another way of looking at, and, it went, and once I dove into it and I, you know, evaluated the solo and put it towards Spanish guitar, I could see all of his, then I could see all of his classical influence in that solo, even though his solo is burning, ripping rock guitar. Right, right. It's called the, the record, I'm looking at it now, uh, Crazy Train, a flamenco tribute to Randy Rhodes uh, with the String Revolution to honor Randy. Randy. So we're yeah. going to hear this for the first time ever anywhere in a second, Steve Stevens' flamenco version of Randy Rhodes. You have a new solo record coming? Eventually, I'll get to it. Well, according to your yeah, publicist, yeah, it's yeah, coming out yeah, January twenty eighth. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> doesn't sound that way, though. No, 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 no. Um, but you've got you got a, or I could be reading that wrong. Yeah. But solo record, you you're working on something. I'm I'm always writing, yeah. Eddie. I'm always writing, and um, <clears throat> and there's so many. You know, working uh, when we started to uh, work uh, on new material with Billy, we started to work with some new people and new writers. Tommy English is one of the writers. Um, brilliant producer uh, named Zach Cervini, who's um, uh, just a guitar nut. I mean, he and I in the studio are like two guitar nerds. And also Butch Walker. And I've, so I've started to work with all these new people, and I'm like, I really want to bring all these people in uh, to work on a guitar solo record, you know, with vocalists and all these great singers I've worked with. So it'll, it'll definitely, um, you know, it'll definitely happen, uh, obviously with, you know, my commitments with, with Billy or, uh, will take me through right. the end of the, end of the summer we tour in Europe and then we're doing rock and Rio, but eventually I will be doing a solo record. Well, you can see Steve with Billy Idol, a big tour coming up starting soon as they go out with journey. So get ready for that. Well, that's going to wrap it up for my conversation with Steve Stevens. Appreciate you guys checking it out.